Mr. Noshad Forbes is co-chairman Forbes Marshall. Uh, he headed the Confederation of Indian Industry in 2016-17. Recently, he authored a book, The Struggle and the Promise, Restoring India's Potential. What inspired you to write this book? I mean, why this book in the current times? What is its topicality? So, you know, the book really is, it's a long-term play. <laughs> it reflects uh, my really deep long-term belief in India's potential. I mean, even, you know, in our history growing up, uh, when I've been most frustrated about things that we've, that I would look around and see us doing or not doing, um, I would always, I would, I would always have this huge, it came, that frustration came from huge conviction about our potential in the long run. So it's a, it's very much a long-term thing that I've believed for decades. Um, second, uh, more specifically, uh, the year that I was uh, the president of CI, uh, and when I had an opportunity to meet so many people worldwide um, in different uh, in different countries, different fields, uh, that only reinforced that sense of potential, that sense of uh, what uh, we could really achieve uh, as a country. And then third was opportunity. You know, when the pandemic hit. Um, the uh, the fact that uh, I was not traveling at all for well over a year was a great opportunity to read a lot and write a lot. So uh, uh, from from the perspective of I, ha I actually had the, the book committed with the publisher uh, in 2019, well before the pandemic hit. Um, but the actual work of writing the book happened during the pandemic. So in a sense, those three things came together. There was the very long term. There was uh, uh, five, six years back, and then there was the the current pandemic that was that provided an opportunity to actually get the book done. Does it still uh, frustrate you uh, 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 about where India is compared <laughs> to its potential? India, in India, for for me, ha, you know, has always been has always been every day, I would say, uh, a country that simultaneously inspires and frustrates. Um, and there'll be something that I will read or come across that I say, you know, this is what makes us so special and so wonderful. And there'll be something else that I'll come across very often on the same day that says to me, we could be so much better. Why are we wasting either wasting needless emotional energy or physical energy or whatever, doing something that doesn't help us. So um, uh, it's a daily thing. Um, that makes That's what makes us, uh, if you ask me, such a great and vibrant place to live. It's constantly alive. <laughs> uh, what are the grounds on the basis of which uh, you uh, say in the book uh, that India has the potential to be the leader in the world? As I, as I argue in the book, um, the f leading the world requires a strong, large, vibrant economy, and it requires being a strong, large country. Yeah. So both those things are essential requirements. You can't, you know, you can have a very, a very, very wise Singapore or UAE or whatever, but they're too small to really make a huge difference in the world. They can be inspiring they can be they can play a very valuable role um, but they can't aspire to world leadership you know when you you need to be you need to have a certain heft and size and scale so that's a first that's a first thing and thanks to our population we have uh, that one essential attribute second um, you need to have a vibrant strong economy uh, and that's why Pre-1991, we mattered very little to the world because we had a small economy. And it's only as we've started to matter more and more and have moved up the, uh, the ranking of world economies that we've started to count for uh, a more prominent place in the world. And I think uh, now as the fifth largest economy in the world, I think as we keep moving up, I think we need to, over time, become one of the top three and when we become, you know, one of the top three, then I think we count for even more. Yeah. Uh, third, I think for any country to lead the world, you need to be an attractive country. 
this is the this is to me a huge advantage over china the fact that we have um, that the fact that we're a liberal democracy the fact that we include the fact that uh, you have everything what we were talking about earlier on you know you have we're not a neat organized systematic uh, boring place we are uh, constantly alive and vibrant and we have experiences and art and culture that appeals to everyone and i think that soft power that we have um is one of the essential attributes of being able to lead and then the last piece is a really vibrant strong private sector led economy and ngo led economy i think those attributes is what gives us an argument if you like uh for being one of the leaders of the world it's that combination of things india is the fifth largest economy and uh, in years to come it could be the uh, in top 3 but when you say the leader the, do you have in mind that india will be the top most uh, uh, the biggest economy in the world as you know um, you know china was nowhere in the ranking today china is not only the second largest economy but it's uh, in purchasing power parity terms people argue that it is already uh, larger than the us um in nominal terms it still has some way to clo- to go before it uh, matches the us um india has the same population as china china today is five times our size as an economy five times the per capita gdp five times the overall gdp we were at the same level uh, 40 years ago uh, and 40 years back in these 40 years china grew faster than india uh, that's why it's five times our size now we have to in the next 40 years grow faster than china um and if we do and if we are the same size as china and in 40 years in much less than that china is going to be the world's largest economy if we match china in terms of economic uh, well being then i think uh, we will be the world's largest economy is there any time frame where we can uh, at- tap this potential or meet this potential Uh, already our uh, goal of 5 trillion economy has been pushed uh, back by 2 years yes so you know i think we have to i think we should see leadership as a two step process first step is to be a leader of the world second step is to be the leader of the world um the first step if you ask me is more important if we want to be a leader of the world i think we can that we can aspire to today in the next couple of years and you know how do we get together with other like minded powers other other countries that have a similar belief in a rules based international order to use the phrase that uh, everyone likes to use um and when we say rules based international order we have to we have to ourselves be leading adherents of that rules based international order i think we have to see ourselves and carry ourselves as that kind of liberal open wide ranging interested in everything supporting anything that's good regardless of with what nationality it comes with you know that that broader open perspective that i think i think is consistent with leading the world i think we have the elements for it but i think it will require it requires some shift as i uh, as i talk about in the book and as i go into in perhaps more too more too much detail um i think i think we have the the scope and the potential uh, to do that and do that relatively quickly so a leader of the world is what i think we should really aspire to here and now the leader of the world will follow let's play a leader of the world role consistently for a decade or two and then let's see if we can uh, move on from a to b but why uh, uh, we are not there uh, at the moment what ails uh, our economy we need a combination of uh, of uh, industry and change in what industry does change in institutions and how we manage and change in the role of the state and the policies that we have and it's those so there are lots of changes needed and we need to recognize that the way in which industry institutions policy will interact one with the other needs to be done consistent with our broad very diverse country and culture if we behave as we do as indians then 
let's define the state role and the government role as a limited role. They have some essential things to do, and those essential things the government must do well. And by doing just very few things, it should do them well. But there are many, many things that our state tries to do that it does badly and which it should get out of the way for. That's the story post-1991. The state simply stopped doing certain things and the country progressed. The state needs to continue stopping doing things and leave it to the private sector to take those on. Running Air India is a good example of progress that we've seen recently, by the way. That's the kind of thing the state should not do. National priority is to create million of jobs in the informal sector and contract labor. Do repeal of uh, uh, form laws, uh, does that affect uh, creating uh, shifting million of jobs uh, to the manufacturing sector? Well, you know, the, the farm laws, I thought the farm laws were a good thing. Um, I thought they were a, a, a good reform, but the farm laws would help in boosting agricultural productivity. Uh, the farm laws were not going to create employment as such. We've been successful as an economy in creating millions of informal occupations, informal jobs. Informal jobs are better than these agricultural jobs and these marginal productivity agricultural jobs that people came from. But they're not great jobs and they're not great jobs because they don't have security and they don't have the ability to raise productivity in the long run. That's what makes manufacturing jobs so attractive. Uh, we know how to raise productivity and we can put relatively unskilled people to work by the million in good quality jobs. That's the advantage of manufacturing. It's something that we've generally missed. Even our manufacturing growth has not been employment led. It's been skill and capital intensive led. There are exceptions. Uh, tourism is a wonderful exception. It's an opportunity to build billions of good quality jobs in services. Um, there are exceptions and those exceptions are certainly great opportunities for us as a country. Recently, uh, former Abe governor Rakunam Rajan has uh, uh, prescribed uh, in a lecture in St. Stephen's as well as in his article in uh, newspapers that India should rather focus on services-led export strategy uh, instead of focusing on manufacturing. What's your take on that? I would remind you that Prime Minister Vajpayee um, talked about how uh, India may have missed the manufacturing revolution, um, but we would go straight from the agricultural revolution to the uh, uh, services, uh, the, you know, from an agricultural based economy to a services economy. I was skeptical then, I'm still skeptical. Uh, and the reason I'm skeptical is not because of growth. I think we can have a very rapidly growing economy on the back of um, huge service growth. Uh, that's what we've actually had. Um, I'm skeptical only from the employment perspective, that for us to really be a vibrant, successful economy in the long run, we need to create millions and millions of good quality jobs. I struggle to think of how we will create millions and millions of good quality jobs only through services. Where are those opportunities? They are in a set of jobs, right? Um, but look at the bulk of service sector jobs in developed countries, huh? in developed countries. The bulk of service sector jobs are not the skill intensive jobs of let's say doctors um, and bankers and so on. The bulk of those jobs are people who serve food in restaurants, um, people who clean homes, um, you know, nurses more than doctors. So I think uh, I think Raghuram Rajan is exactly right um, in advocating um, a real good focus service sector export oriented drive. He's exactly right to be arguing that we should be in our negotiations for trade uh, with developed countries. We should be focusing hard and requiring uh, that these service sector exports and remote service provision should be permitted freely. All of that is exactly right. Will that in itself add up to the millions of jobs that we need? 
that's where I'm skeptical. I think we need, we're too big a country. I think we need it all. We need lots of service sector, sector jobs to be created. We need lots of manufacturing jobs to also be created. Thanks a lot, uh, Mr. Forb. If you like this video, share it and subscribe to Business Standard. For more news, views and insights, log on to www.business-standard.com. Do also follow us on YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Telegram and LinkedIn.